over the last year or so, we've been told by AMD that caches are really important for high performance gaming. Well, here I'm going to tell you about a new technology coming from IBM that may be the future of how caches will enable faster gaming in the future. What's your minimum specification? If you want an independent cloud services provider for home servers, VPNs, or clients, consider Linode and sign up today at linode.com slash techtechpotato for a free $100 60-day credit. A recent Gardner performance report shows the Node's topology offers almost double the database performance per dollar than other public cloud services. So this video is going to be split into two halves. First half, I'm going to speak about what caches are and how they work and what important in the trade-offs of caches between size and performance. If you know all that already, skip to part two, which is going to talk all about the technology. But start part one. What is a cache and why do we need them? Well, in order to feed a core, in order to make the core work, you need to feed it data and it operates on the data. How does a CPU core get the data? Well, consider the basic scenario of having just a CPU core and DRAM. Every time you need data, you need to go out to DRAM, collect it, bring it back into the core, work on it, and put it back into DRAM. Now, in order to go out to DRAM and back, it takes around 300 clock cycles, which in the land of CPU is an eternity. So you put a little memory in between the two called a cache. What this cache is, is a faster way to get that data rather than going all the way out to main memory. Now, a modern CPU will have many levels of caches. They start really small because they're really, really fast, the you know, L1 cache. Then you might have a slightly bigger, slightly slower L2 cache, and then an even bigger, even slightly slower L3, and then you go all the way out to main memory. The idea here is that you're trading off size for latency. So if your CPU core can predict exactly what data it needs before you need it, that's our whole point about branch prediction in a modern computer core, it will try and pull it from main memory and stick it in either your L1 or your L2 caches. So it's there ready for when you need it and you get the benefit, the speed up of the performance the core can actually deliver. When you've used your data line, your cache line from your L1, it gets evicted and then placed into the L2. If the L2 is full, it finds the oldest cache line in the L2 and bumps it to L3. And the idea is maybe you might need that cache line again. So when you need that data, it'll search in your L1, your L2, your L3 to check if it's there before going out to main memory and pulling it all the way back in. Now in that concept, I'm considering a single core. When you've got multiple cores, it's a little bit different and you have two types of caches to deal with. You have a private cache, which means that only that core has access to it. In a modern Intel core, a modern AMD core, you have a very tiny L1 cache that is private to that core. You also have a private L2 cache to that core. But when you move out to the L3, you'll find that it's a shared cache. It's shared between all the cores in a chiplet or all the cores in a die. That means that that cache, all chips have access to it. So when it evicts cache lines from the L2 into the L3, all the cores can see what's in there. So if another core had just happens to need a cache line evicted from the first core, then it can pull it in from the L3. Now, unfortunately, there are trade-offs with caches. You know, it sounds like what we really need is a massive one gigabyte L1 cache on every core. But really, there are three key limitations you have to think about when you design a cache. First one is exactly where it is in the core and the size of it. If you're, if you're building a very detailed core that has to be designed in a certain way to get a maximum performance, maybe you've only got space for a four kilobyte L1 cache or a 16 kilobyte L1 cache. If you immediately go in and say, I want a 128 kilobyte L1 cache, that may distort the rest of your core design and the core itself may perform less optimally. So typically you have to find the balance between what works best for the size, for the die area, around your core, especially for the L1, in order to get the right, in order to get your trade-off for performance. Your L2 is usually less constrained by that, and then your L3 is more constrained by the actual full die size of what you want to produce. The second trade-off with caches is utility. Now, what I mean by this is, is your cache the right size for the workload? Normally when we speak about cores, we speak about the general x86 for PC and server and enterprise, 
or ARM for smartphones and servers and enterprise. A lot of cores that are designed these days aren't actually those. They're sort of more smaller embedded type cores for IoT applications or dedicated tasks. Now in those sorts of situations especially, that core is being designed for one very specific task. And you end up having a very exact profile of your workload, exactly what the workload is going to do in relation to how much data it needs, how much bandwidth it needs, how much it's going to operate on the execution units of the core. So you can profile your caches to fit exactly for the peak performance of your workload profile. Intel, AMD, ARM, they don't have this luxury because they know their cores are going to run you know, everything and anything. So what they do is they reach out to their key customers and with Intel and AMD, that's usually, you know, the hyperscaler customers, but also on the consumer side, we have gaming workloads and workstation workloads, and they will do a general profile of everything that's out there and see how it performs with different size caches with different size latencies. And they will try and pick the best combination for their design. If you're building like a small IoT core, you can match it perfectly. So you have the right cache hit rate, which means you find your data in the lowest possible cache and you save time, you save that extra latency. Whereas the more general purpose CPU cores will try and find the right cache for the market in you know any given year. And as you know, workloads evolve over time. So both AMD and Intel and then also ARM try and build their cores a few years out and try and predict what will be the main you know, profile of the workload at the time for their caches. The third consideration for the size of your cache is actually latency of the cache itself. Now, as a general rule, the bigger your cache, the longer it takes to march through it to find data if it's there or not. This is just because larger caches take longer to search through. And what you'll find is the small, really tiny L1 caches, they will take anywhere between three and five cycles to search through to get your data, whereas an L2 cache may take 11 cycles to 19 cycles, depending on how big it is. Then your L3 cache may be about 40, 50 cycles. And then your main memory, you're looking at you know 150 to 300 cycles. But if you make your L2 double the size, you're not doubling the latency, but you're definitely increasing the latency because you have more to deal with. Now, there's a lot more going on here with regards to associativity and TLBs and such. But as a general rule, you if you make your caches bigger, it's going to take longer to search through them and therefore you'll have a higher latency. Now, AMD, Intel, ARM, and everyone else puts a lot of work into making their L1 and L2 caches especially as low latency as possible. So that's why sometimes we see these companies doubling, say, their L2 cache for only the cost of one cycle of extra latency because they figure out a way how to either hide the latency or reduce the latency. And it's all very clever. It goes way above my head. But it's there because any improvement to latency on your L1 and your L2 can improve immediate performance. However, bigger caches reduce your miss rate, so reduce your overall average latency. And this is where the trade-off comes in. So what has IBM done that is so revolutionary? Well, IBM has a range of processors. Well, it's known for two processors. It's power processors and it's Z processors, or would say Z, but because IBM is American, it's IBM Z. IBM Z is what we're going to focus on here. Now, if you've not heard of IBM Z before, have you ever heard of the word mainframe? Does that sound like a really 80s, 90s concept for what a computer is? Well, IBM still manufactures them because they're really, really important for the market that we live in today. Mainframes or big iron are there to ensure that everything happens exactly and right. And if that sounds a bit wishy-washy, well, think about when you interact with your bank. If you do a transaction, you need to make sure that that transaction completes fully to the end, regardless of any hardware failure along that line. With that transaction, the bank has to do fraud detection and that has to work seamlessly. And basically everything has to work. There has to be redundancy built in, there has to be security. And that's what IBM specializes in with its IBM Z platform. Before the recent disclosure at Hot Chips, IBM Z's latest platform was the Z15. Now, this is an absolutely insane platform. I, I'm going to try and explain how insane this is. But normally when we think of a processor and a system, we think of one processor equals one system. 
Not so with IBM Z15. You have five processors equals one system, but then you have four systems or five systems equals one saleable unit. Inside one of those you know, five processor systems, you have two types of processor. You have a compute processor and a system processor. The compute processor has 12 cores in it, running at about 5.2 gigahertz, and has four megabytes of L2 and 32 megabytes of L3 for a total of 256 megabytes of L3 across the cache, shared cache. It's a big 700 square millimeter chip, and you have four of those. They're connected in two pairs, and then they're connected to a systems processor, which is a basically one big piece of L4 cache. It's 700 square millimeters of L4 cache, about 960 megabytes, so almost a gigabyte of L4 cache on a separate die itself. That systems processor with all that L4 cache, that connects to four other systems. So your single saleable unit from IBM, for your IBM Z, is 25 700 square millimeter processors, where you've got 20 of these compute processors, each with 12 cores, and then five of these L4 cache system processor chips as well. So you're talking about gigabytes and gigabytes of cache built into multiple processor racks with failover and all those good IBM uh, Z things. Now, IBM, a couple of weeks ago, a hot chips, launched or announced their next generation Z16 platform, or they're codenaming it Telem. It's going to be promoted as IBM Telem. They're going away with Z plus number, and now it's just Telem, but it's still part of the IBM Z family. Hi, my name is Christian Jacoby. I'm the chief architect for Z processor design. And today, I'm introducing the IBM Telem chip. Telem is the next generation processor for IBM Z and Linux One systems. They're ditching the whole system processor, compute processor arrangement. And instead, we get a singular die design built on Samsung 7 nanometer, about 530 square millimeters. And the core design kind of looks like this. Now, what we've got labeled here is essentially one core and it's L2 cache. And you notice that there are eight of these and they basically take up the rest of the die. What we're seeing here is that chip has an L2 cache, but no L3 cache. And in this processor, there's no physical L4 cache either. For whatever reason, IBM has decided that nobody needs L3 cache or L4 cache anymore. Everything is going to be in the L2. And what we have here is a single core with a 32 megabyte private L2 cache. Now, this L2 cache is 19 cycles of latency. Compare that to 12 cycles on AMD and Intel. But it's 64 times the size of the L2 cache on a Zen 3 core. So you have 64 times the size, but the latency is about plus 50% at the end of the day. And that's the trade-off IBM's going with here. Now you may think, well, okay, you've got a core with a private cache, private L2 cache. Are you saying there's no shared caches at all anywhere on this chip? Because what, uh, what IBM does with this chip is they put two bits of silicon on a package and that becomes your socket. So you have a 16 cores, per socket, four sockets in a system for 64 cores, and then you have four systems together for 32 chips for 256 cores, and there's no L3 in there at all. What IBM has done here completely blows my mind, really. What you have with the core, with your L2, with your private L2, it will fill up the L2 as it needs from the memory per chip. And then when it comes time to say, well, there's not enough room in L2, we need to kick something out. We're going to bring in a cache line and we're going to kick an old cache line out, out of the L2. What that cache line will do is it will try and find space on any other L2 on the chip. If it finds space, it will be put there and it will be labeled as an L3 cache line. What we have here is virtual L3. All the cache on the chip is essentially L2 until something gets kicked out. It will move to another core if there's space and it will be labeled L3. So while a chip on its own personal view has 32 megabytes of private L2 cache, it can use all the other L2 caches on the chip as if they were a virtual shared L3 cache. So now you have 256 megabytes of L3 cache per chip. But wait, there's more. Between sockets, if something needs to be kicked out of that shared L3 on the chip, 
it can go to another socket and be labeled as a shared L4 cache line. So now when we have a 32 chip wide system, you can have eight gigabytes of virtual shared L4 cache. The chip contains eight processor cores running at more than five gigahertz. The processor cores are what's executing the actual program. And then each processor core is connected to a 32 megabyte private level two cache. So with these virtual caches, what this means is that if the cache line that a core needs ends up being in a sh it ends up being in this virtual L3 on the same core as itself, it has a 19 cycle latency rather than you know a 30 cycle latency that a normal L3 would be. If it can't, it has to go find it on another core, which has a 12, 12 nanosecond latency if it's on chip, then it has additional latency if it's off chip. If we apply this to a modern day Zen 3 chiplet, for example, now on the Zen 3 chiplet, it has eight cores. Each of those cores has 512 kilobytes of L2, and there is 32 megabytes of L3 cache on the chiplet. So that's 36 megabytes of L2 plus L3. Now imagine if all of that was L2, split up, that's what, four and a half megabytes of L2 per core, and then each core could allocate the L2 of another core as shared L, virtual shared L3. You, you, Hardware and Box has done this test where it says that more L3 cache matters. Well, now we have a situation where we have more L2 cache, which is more important per core, and then you have an even larger virtual L3 in the event that cores don't need the extra L2. It just makes sense how this works. It really is crazy because, I mean, think about AMD with its upcoming V cache technology. There, they're putting a 64 megabyte L3 cache chiplet on the die. Imagine if that 64 megabytes wasn't L3, it was L2. Now you'd have another eight megabytes of L2 per core. So that's 10 and a half megabytes of L2 per core. That, you know, with a 19 to say 20 cycle, if there's an extra one for going to the V cache, latency. I mean, yes, you're having an increased latency on your L2, but your L2 is now stonkingly massive. I mean, this is perhaps why I think caches might go this way in the future. Now, there is a lot of secret sauce behind all of this. I tried to get IBM to explain it to me, and it, they were speaking about keeping track of cache lines and cycle counters and broadcasting and make sure cache lines are invalidated. And it was going way above my head. But they said simply, we've got it to work. Some people don't believe it works. I've spoken to a few peers. Others will say, well, if it does work, then this is amazing. This could really be the future of how cash will work in the future. And I keep saying future a lot because just imagine not having to say you know, L2, L3, L4, saying whether it's shared or private. Now all cash is all things to all cores. And that kind of makes sense. Now benefits here, wrap it around to gaming. Having that super large, super flat L2 per core, then having still having a massive shared virtual L3, that's gonna help, that's gonna help. But it has to be designed in such a way that makes it real. Now, I, it's possible that IBM has patents up the wazoo to do with this. And uh, you may remember that IBM and Intel now have a cross patent deal and they're going to be working together on future chips. So even though I've been talking, well, what happened if we put this on an AMD core? Could be coming more so to an Intel core in the future if Intel wants to adopt this technology. I'm sure that if Intel really wanted or AMD really wanted, they could put the comparison about how their fixed physical L2, L3 caches might be better than a shared L3, a shared virtual L3 cache. And that's going to be an argument around about latency, saying maybe latency is more important to consumers than having, you know, this massive L2 cache with bandwidth or consumer workloads don't benefit from having massive caches like that. But we'll see. We'll see. I think this is one of the best features to come out of hot chips this year. So I wanted to share it with you. I hope you've learned a little bit about caches today and uh, what we could be seeing in the future. My minimum specification here is that uh, if we get Milan with 3D vCache installed, that's 768 megabytes, 
of L3 cache across the chip. What if that was L2? If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it will instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support. Thank you.